I think of water all the time. And I can recall being six or seven years old and having regular dreams of playing with my pet dolphin in our backyard swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And then at the ripe old age of nine or 10, when I became a real sophisticated thinker, I remember telling my parents, wouldn't it be cool if you could put turbines underwater to produce power from currents like the Gulf Stream? Where do kids come up with these ideas? Well, 35 years later, I'm still thinking of water all the time, and I'm working on a wide variety of water resources issues, and I'm using my skills as a scientist to try and help advance the development of energy from tides and ocean currents. Somebody pinch me. Could this be my beautiful life? And I'm doing it in my hometown of Miami, which is facing increasingly significant challenges from a water resources and an energy point of view. Now, Miami's a fascinating place. It's a big city, but it feels a little bit like a small town. It's multicultural at so many different levels. And it's a city that literally exists in a crucible of natural forces, many of which are driven by the power of water. And whether we really realize it or not, our lives, our quality of life, and our survival here in South Florida and anywhere else around the world is inextricably linked to this power of water. How could it not be when you think of how much of this planet is comprised of water? So consider this. 70% of Earth is covered by water. 98% of that is salt. And only 2% of it is fresh. And of that meager 2%, two-thirds of it is inaccessible because it's locked up in the glaciers and it's locked up in ice sheets. So that leaves less than 1% of total global water as fresh and available to us, plants, animals, humans included. So in that context, it's undeniable that water would have the power to influence just about everything that it touches or that it doesn't touch for that matter. And in South Florida, water from the Everglades and Lake Okeechobee have yielded vast groundwater supplies that have had the power to drive the development in this region, for better or for worse, by virtue of easy access. And in another manner of looking at it, water flowing through drainage canals for flood control has had the power to transform entire ecosystems by virtue of what it carries in it. Now, in this context, you can't help but imagine that the power of water could literally influence everything that we do. And the exploration into the sustainable use of marine resources for hydrokinetic energy development is something that has really piqued our curiosity as scientists particularly as the world begins to realize that we can't continue on the energy production path that we're on. So in this vein, we're essentially using our scientific skills to help energy developers roll out new technologies for power production from tides and ocean currents. And we're doing it the way scientists only know how, by collecting a lot of data, and then turning it into usable information. So we're using our approaches, our analytical tools, to characterize the hydrokinetic potential of locations. We're steering energy developers to the sweet spot within those locations. And we're researching the potential impacts and the interactions that technology has on the marine environment in order to minimize harm and maximize benefit. Now, how we got going down this road of oceanographic surveying in support of marine renewable energy development is actually kind of an interesting story, and it's snowballed ever since. About four years ago, our lab at the University of Massachusetts School for Marine Science was approached by one of this country's leading marine renewable energy developers and they needed some advice on how to make current measurements in the ocean. And at the time, they weren't quite the leading developers that they are now. And, well, 
I'd say that they also kind of, let's see. They weren't the leading developers that they are now, and at the same time, but they had a site. And they had a really good site. And, and at least they had, a, and they had a permit to use the site. And so, what they, you know, what we, what we basically, what we were charged to do was investigate the characteristics of that site. And it's really phenomenal in the sense that this location had a 25 foot tide range. By comparison, Miami has a two to three foot tide range. So when the entire Atlantic Ocean would rush into these passages and inlets, they'd set up these incredible currents that were so strong that literally they would form large whirlpools on the ebb and the flood tide that were big enough to drive a 40-foot lobster boat into and have it spin around like a top. Now these guys clearly recognized that this location had plenty of energy potential. But they weren't absolutely positive that the site that they wanted to do their T their testing and project development in was proof positive perfect. I mean, standing on the shore of this channel that's a mile wide and 300 feet deep and watching the white water rip by, you couldn't help but think that just about any location was fine. But, and it's a big but, when you're spending millions of dollars to do something that's never been done before. They thought, let's get some guys who know a little bit about oceanography not a whole lot about public speaking, <laughs> to see if maybe we could prove to ourselves that where we were going to do our, our testing and our project development was going to be OK. So to make the long story short, we teamed up, and we started doing data collection for them. And it was eye-opening for them, and it was really fun for us. <laughs> it turns out they had a fantastic site but only on half the tide, which is a problem when you're trying to produce power 24 hours a day. And it begs the question then, okay, Johnny, so if this isn't a good, good site, well then, where should we do our testing and project development? And it's not an easy question to answer. And you would ask, why? And I would tell you, well, everything in the marine environment is extremely complicated. Not only is it complicated, but it's dynamic. So not only do you have to figure things out in space, but you have to figure things out in time. And that's just the start of it. Now fortunately, for everyone in this story, it's a happy story and it keeps writing itself. They moved forward with their project development and their technology testing and they're in third generation turbine design. And as we speak, they're filing their permit applications to mount one of the first ever tidal project, tidal energy projects in the United States. So, that's Maine, this is Miami. Let's come back to Miami and the fantastic position that this city is in to once again benefit from the power of water. Miami has in its backyard one of the most powerful western boundary currents in the world, the Gulf Stream. And it's deep. It's not impossibly deep, but it's deep enough to be able to put turbines underwater to produce power and not impede ship traffic and navigation, which is a big deal. And at 21,000 times the energy of Niagara Falls, the Gulf Stream has been estimated by experts to be able to produce enough power to, gen to, to power seven, upwards of seven million homes and businesses in Florida. That's about equivalent to four to 10 gigawatts of energy. Something like four to 10 nuclear power plants as we see at Turkey Point. Now the beauty is, it's seriously being considered. It's a tremendous amount of power and we're slowly looking into its use. We're looking into it here in South Florida, we're looking into it in the Northeast, and people are looking at it in the Pacific Northwest. But it's still an uphill battle. 
not the least of which because we don't really know all the places where we can do this type of energy development. So the trick is to leverage each other's strengths and talents as nobody can go it alone doing groundbreaking work. Teams of people got men on the moon. Teams of people are looking at technology development, turbine technology development. Teams of people are looking at the economics of ocean energy production. Our team is focused on trying to find all the places where tides in ocean currents can be tapped. Now, the way I see it, marine renewable energy does have potential, but we're like the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk. While they had the challenge of trying to develop a good machine, so too did they have the challenge of finding a good site to test the machine. Now, when it comes to ocean energy, ocean currents, and tidal power, many are focused on trying to develop a good machine. And clearly, that's critical for success. But there's this other less glamorous piece of the puzzle. We're trying to find all the places where you can use the machine. Now, if this new energy sector is ever going to take off, we have to make a commitment at a fine scale level to try and find all the places where significant hydrokinetic energy potential can be developed. Now, Miami, by virtue of its geography and the well of intellectual talent and creativity that exists in this city, has the opportunity to lead the charge into this new energy future if it's willing to embrace the unknown and take the risks. So the next time that you're sitting at a cafe on South Beach, overlooking the ocean, having a froofy little drink on a hot summer day, <laughs> and feeling the, the coolness of the fan spinning over your head, imagine that it could be turning thanks to the power of water flowing by in the ocean. Thank you. Thank you.